I'm in pursuit of Paul. Yeah, some Mark Street. I wonder if there's a uh, St. Paul Street. Do you have St. Paul? Paul? St. Paul? No Paul? Paul the Apostle is the most influential figure in the history of Christianity after Jesus himself. Can I have an orange juice? Does it get much fresher than this, huh? Thank you. The greatest missionary of the church. He traveled the Roman Empire, planting churches everywhere. And 100 shekels. Well, even for 199, no, it was cost me more, believe me. A very good one. Thank, Thank you. you. Very much. All the best. <laughs> and his influence extends well beyond Christianity too. His thinking and his writings have profoundly shaped Western thought. Is this Paul? Paul? St. Paul? Is it St. Paul? His turnaround is one of the biggest recorded in the Bible. Have you got Paul? That's Paul. Oh, it is Paul. That's... There he is. My name is Con Campbell. I've studied Paul's 13 New Testament letters for years. Now I'm on a journey to know Paul better. We know that Paul was a man of action with a singular focus. I know what it feels like to have a single-minded passion. My first passion was jazz and I wanted to become a great jazz saxophonist. You can go anywhere in the world and find people who love jazz, even in Jerusalem. And because of Paul the Apostle and dedicated men and women like him, you can go anywhere in the world and immediately bond with people who share a love for Jesus Christ. My pursuit of Paul the Apostle begins here in Jerusalem. I want to know Paul better. I want to follow his journeys. I want to understand his heart and what he was like. But before Paul was a friend, he was an enemy. Before becoming a follower of Christ, Paul terrorized the followers of Jesus. And for me, it was the radical transformation of this Paul, an, an enemy turned friend, the Paul before and after, that I find so compelling. Paul's Jewish birth name was Saul. His Roman name was Paul. In around AD 4 or 5, Paul was born a Roman citizen in the city of Tarsus, in what is the country of Turkey today. At the time of Jesus and Paul, the temple stood on top of the Western Wall. Today, the Muslim shrine, the Dome of the Rock, holds that position. In first century Jerusalem, religious leaders took action when a new movement within Judaism called the Way seemed to threaten the very foundations of traditional Judaism. The way described the followers of Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified by the Romans in AD 33. Saul was part of a Jewish religious sect known as the Pharisees. They were the most respected conservative group among the Jewish people of the first century holding closely to the law of Moses and other ancient traditions. To help me understand more about Paul's Jewish heritage, I met a guide in the Jewish quarter of the old city of Jerusalem. All right, thank you. So Kenny, thanks for meeting with me, and I'm glad you can show me around a little bit. It's a pleasure. You're very welcome. So we're here in the Jewish quarter of Jerusalem. Right. What, what's the Jewish quarter all about? It's a very uh, significant uh, historical archaeological site. 
Yeah. Uh, it's a very popular uh, shopping commercial area. But uh, I would say, first and foremost, today, the Jewish quarter is a Jewish residential neighborhood. Right. And orthodox, religious Jewish. Right. So it's a very religious community. Yes. Okay. There are over 700 um, practicing orthodox Jewish families uh, okay. uh, living here now. Now, it's a Friday, and Shabbat is coming up oh, in a few yes, hours this yes. evening. How will this scene change oh, as from, that approaches? Yes, of course, from day to night. Uh, all of these uh, shops and um, uh, restaurants will close, and everybody will r uh, rush home. Mm -hmm. and uh, be prepared uh, okay. for the Shabbat. Okay, interesting. Immediately one senses that this neighborhood is distinct. It's ordered. There's a, a visible conformity. And women dress modestly and men wear black, black pants, black coats, black hats. Beards are common. Many also wear the small cap called a kippah, believing that the head is to be covered at all times to honor God. Shops display items of Jewish religious commitment and celebration. I think Saul would have felt quite comfortable here in the Jewish quarter. Later, Paul described his commitment to Judaism. If anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. After the death and resurrection of Jesus, a young man named Stephen was one of the first people to respond to the preaching of the apostles. Stephen was the first person to be killed for his faith in Jesus. When Stephen was stoned outside Jerusalem, we're told a young man named Saul was there giving approval to his death. This is Stephen's Gate. It's the traditional site where Stephen was stoned to death. And the very first time that Saul is mentioned in history is him standing right here, giving approval to Stephen's death. On the day that Stephen was killed, a violent persecution broke out against the church. And Saul was filled with a zealous rage against the followers of Jesus. He went from house to house, locking up men and women, throwing them into prison. And he even went so far as to get a letter from the high priest so that he could go up to the synagogues in Damascus and arrest the followers of Jesus and bring them back to Jerusalem as his prisoners. Having received authority and soldiers from the high priest, Saul left Jerusalem and headed north toward Damascus to hunt down and arrest other followers of Jesus. We don't know how Paul traveled, but given the support of the high priest, he, he may have had horses. But whether by horse or on foot, it was not an easy journey. He'd need to cover about 20 miles a day for seven days to reach Damascus. You have to wonder what kind of person would do that. There were two routes Saul could have taken north. Either way would take him near the town of Capernaum. Capernaum lies on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee on an ancient international highway. This was home base for Jesus during his three and a half years of public ministry. Jesus would have known the synagogue in Capernaum. It was rebuilt in the third or fourth century on what some believe is the original foundation. Paul would have been reminded that the heresy of Jesus began right here 
and perhaps that strengthened his determination to stop its spread. I kept thinking about how hard it was for a Jewish person to follow Jesus and how hard it can be for followers today. On my way toward Damascus, I met with Menno Kalisha, a Jewish pastor from Jerusalem. He was camping with some students here in northern Israel, in Galilee. So, Menno, I am in pursuit of Paul, and he, at this stage of his life, was Saul of Tarsus in pursuit of people just like you. That is, Jewish people who have recognized that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is God's anointed King, the Christ. And that's you. Well, thank you. What does it mean for someone who is Jewish to become a Christian, to accept Jesus as a Messiah? What does that mean for you? Well, for me, it's to find the truth. I found the treasure. Yeah. But when it comes to the price on earth, and I suppose that's what you meant, well, the struggle just starts. <laughs> because you have to understand what your own nation think about Jesus, mm -hmm. okay? For them, Jesus is heresy. For them, Jesus is everything that the Gentile Christian world did against Jews. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to understand that many of the people in Israel divide the world in a very cubical and easy way. If you are from Africa or from some Arab countries, you are a Muslim. If you are from Israel, you're supposed to be a Jew. If you're from the Far East, you're a Buddhist or whatever they have there. And if you are from Europe, you're a Christian. Mm -hmm. And under this calculation, Nazis are Christians too. Mm -hmm. What the Catholic Church did in the worst times of the medieval time through the Inquisition and so on, that's Christianity. Yeah. Do you think that the true Messiah will do what they did to our own people? Mm. So when I call and ask something or I introduce myself to some people, sometimes, sometimes, and it's very hard, but some people will answer by phone, Hitler didn't do a good job, you're still alive. Yeah. You totally understand where it comes from. You look what happened in Africa, you see what happened in different places. People are put to death by machine guns only because they believe in Jesus. This is persecution. Yeah. You see what happened in the first century for believers. This is persecution. Mm -hmm. I cannot complain. The next morning, I approached the Syrian border, closer to where Paul would be confronted by the resurrected Jesus. I'd traveled from Jerusalem to an overlook called Mount Bental. The United Nations uses this border location as an observation point into Syria. From here it's only about 35 miles or 56 kilometers to Damascus. Concrete trenches from past wars connect to underground bunkers. And tensions remain in the region. Nearly 2,000 years ago, right here, another drama was playing out for Paul. It's pretty special for me to be here and to think about the fact that somewhere along this plane, Paul traveled on his way to Damascus. So somewhere along here, Paul was encompassed by a bright light, brighter than the sun, he said, and he heard a voice speak to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And the voice responded, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. He was going to Damascus to hunt people who were followers of this Jesus. And now this Jesus had appeared to him and he realized that he had it all wrong about him. And this would change everything for Paul. Paul's regret that he had harmed innocent people reminded me of a story that Pastor Kalisher told me. I served in the Air Force in a classified weapon system. One of the pilots went through Lebanon 
and he saw a convoy of tanks. What do you think he's doing? Goes down and simply destroyed the convoy. And all this convoy is destroyed in few buttons. You come back to the base and what do you think? Here is the hero. Mm. Only to wait a few minutes after. You kill your own brothers. Yeah. It's true, we call it today friendly fire. So, Paul described himself in exactly that way. He was zealous, he was passionate, he wanted to bring glory to God, but his zeal was not according to knowledge. But I do believe that after meeting Christ and realizing, I thought that I'm killing enemies and I'm killing God's children. How could I be so blind? And I'm not alone. I mean, I'm following my chief rabbi. The high priest gave me the license. Mm. Where did we go wrong? Where, where did we misunderstand the Bible that God comes down to earth and we call him the devil? Mm. I'm sure it was the shock of his life. Yeah. And the moment the coin clicked or dropped, he realized that he was like the worst murderers on earth. And to be the most horrific murderer against God, meeting God face to face, and God tells you, you are my child, you are my ambassador, I'm using you to glorify my name. If this is not grace, what grace is? Mm. Because God's grace was enough for him. But I do believe that when he said, I die for myself and live for Christ, that was the source. One of the reasons I'm a follower of Jesus is because of Paul's testimony of what happened along here on his way to Damascus. I was someone who was totally committed to something else. For me, it was playing jazz music and being a professional musician, you have to give it 110%. You're practicing several hours every day, making all your decisions around what's good for music, what's best for your career, that kind of thing. And that was my position in life. I was dug in. That was, that was, that's what it was all about for me. But I had a radical change of direction. A bit like Paul, perhaps not quite as radical as he is. But I realized that the direction I was heading in ultimately was not the right one. And that for me to head in the right direction, like Paul, I had to become a follower of Jesus and set my path in that direction. And once I did that, that changed everything. My meaning in life, purpose, uh, what I would spend my time doing, what I felt was important, and ultimately who I was doing it for. That's probably the biggest change. Rather than living for myself and for my own fame or glory or achievement, uh, I was now living to serve Him. Looking back, I'm grateful. And so was Paul. Later he wrote, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them, but I received mercy. <laughs>